Um, well, hi, everyone. As Kate said, I'm, I'm Vicky, and I work with uh, Verily, which is formerly known as Google Life Sciences. I am super excited to be here today to share a little bit about my story, what is it that I do, and how I ended up coming here. Um, before I start, maybe I'll point to the title of my presentation and say the pursuit of the tricorder, which is my dream. And I want to see a show of hands. How many know what is the tricorder? <laughs> OK. So, so the tricorder is a fictitious device from, from the show Star Trek. And what's really cool about it is that it, is, it has a series of sensors and computer and can analyze data uh, and, and uh, actually give information, especially there is a version of the medical tricorder specifically to diagnose a disease if something is wrong with someone uh, so that then something can happen. We can actually make sure that uh, that person is treated properly. Okay, so we said uh, I am part of Google, and maybe a show of hands, who here knows Google or some of the Google products? Great. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the uh, search engine and maps. So I'll use that a little bit as a framework as to how we're thinking maybe uh, around life sciences. So uh, when I was your age and I needed to find information, I had to go to the library. And I still go to the library, and I find it very much fun. But I don't have to run to the library every time I have a question. Uh, there's an easier way to actually search for information. And this is one of the, the basic things that Google has done. Um, so here, for example, this morning, coming here, you could have checked uh, Computer History Museum uh, at Google and come up with a map of how to get here, possibly, and maybe what time the museum opens, and so forth. So this is the kind of thing that, that Google does. And what I said I do is, is Google Life Sciences, which now is, is, is called Verily Life Sciences. And the question is maybe, what is it uh, that, that we do here? So the project started as part of Google X and what we called the Moonshot Project. Uh, and it, was so, it became so big because there are so many problems to studying the life sciences uh, that it actually spun out and became its own company. Uh, we think now what we're called the Alphabet co uh, series of companies with Google. And what is it to, to say that it's a moonshot project? It's right, like it's aiming really high to make a really big change. Uh, and this is a little bit the way that, that Google X was thinking at the time and still thinking, where you have a huge problem and you're trying to come up with a really big change, right? You need to, to have a really grand solution. And to do that, you need to take advantage of technology. Uh, so, and maybe um, some of you are familiar or might have seen one of these cars coming in. If not, there is actually uh, a, our, our self-driving car. There's uh, one of the models downstairs. And I know some of you will get to, uh, uh, to see a little bit about that and try to understand the technology that is needed, the type of sensors that makes uh, such a car work, the computing that goes behind it, as well as integration with information like maps and uh, traffic and seeing everything around you and being able to, uh, to take advantage advantage of the fact that you have a fleet of these cars that they share their learnings with each other. So they're learning together so rather than one individual car at a time. So as we're speaking of huge problems to address, one can think what better way to try to address problems by actually looking at what are the leading causes for deaths in the country. Uh, and you'll see that there is heart disease up there, diabetes, cancer, stroke, and these are some of the things that we're working on in the life sciences. And then there's accidents as well, uh, which is one of the, the, the major problem that uh, the self-driving car tries to address. And why accidents? Uh, because maybe people, when they drive, are slightly distracted, right? And actually, this is a real picture. The, the gentleman is practicing uh, his musical instrument while driving. So that is a problem. So a little bit here to say a lot of the really neat ideas and solutions to some of these big problems come from science fiction. Uh, so this is a picture from the 60s, uh, 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 cartoon magazine, that actually shows that maybe uh, we don't really need to have the humans to drive the car, but we actually can build a car where you can still relax and, and, uh, and play games and, and get to your destination. 
Um, so where we are today, and as I said, you'll see the artifacts uh, downstairs, uh, we actually have put uh, hundreds of thousands of miles where we have driverless cars that don't actually even have a spot for a driver. They have passenger spots uh, that are moving around uh, the city and, uh, uh, and getting the, the, the necessary improvements uh, to actually make this uh, a reality. And, and I think another exciting part is that now you can see that the entire industry is changing. So there are driving assist programs and so forth. So this, this is something that is actually becoming real. So I spoke a little bit about you know, life sciences and the things now. What is the huge problem we're trying to address? So healthcare, and, and you'll say, you know, I'll, I'll get to that in a second, why that is a big problem. Uh, so we're trying to come up with better diagnostics and better interventions uh, to, to come around with issues we see in the healthcare. And in order to do this, we need to build a lot of tools, uh, some of them computational, some of them experimental. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit about those as well. So just to focus, why is healthcare a big issue? Uh, or the, the general paradigm of how things are done. I think uh, the biggest problem is that everything is reactive and we think it should be proactive. And what do I mean by that? I mean, usually we don't go to the doctor unless we're feeling really sick. Uh, very few people uh, actually try to go in. I know at least this is very true for myself. Uh, and, and, and that can be problematic. So uh, this is an example, actually, uh, father of a, of a close friend uh, 64 years old, no history of disease in the family, healthy lifestyle, exercises regularly, starting to have a hip pain. By the time he goes to the doctor um, and, and goes through a series of tests, they find out that he has advanced metastatic cancer. Uh, and there isn't very much that can be done at that point. So, 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 so what are we trying to say here? There are a lot of problems, especially in a disease like cancer, where if we were to actually understand that someone is sick uh, in the very early stages, there is a lot we can do to help them become healthy again and almost treat it like a chronic disease um, versus actually what happens towards what we call the stage three and four later in the, in the progress of the disease, that things don't look very good, right? The prognosis is not that great. Uh, so this is really what we're trying to do. So before I get into describing a little bit how we, uh, we, we do a variety of things that work and the team that we have uh, to try to address these problems, I'll tell you a little bit about how I decided to become a, a scientist and an engineer. Um, so this is a picture of uh, me and my dad when I was uh, very young. And my dad always had the coolest tools around, and he would always take the time to explain things to me. And I still remember things like, for example, he had magnets and magnifying glasses. And I used to think that magnets are magical. I actually still think magnets are magical. Um, and, and he would always build the, the coolest gadgets. So I thought, wait, like how cool, I can build my own flashlight, I can have little toys, and I don't have to bother about anything. So that was exciting. So I decided I, I don't mind growing up being like my dad, getting to, to build tools and, uh, and so forth. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if people, rec probably not, but this is, uh, in the middle, this is a picture of Marie Curie. So when I was in grade school and I started reading about physics and chemistry, I, uh, I read about this woman, uh, the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, and actually multiple Nobel Prizes. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, like this is, this is an area that you can work on and solve problems that will make such a huge impact that people generations later are impacted positively by, by, by your work. So I'm starting to feel really good about my, uh, my inclination. I definitely think that science and engineering is, is the way to go. And then, of course, uh, another thing I was lucky enough uh, when I was 11 uh, to come visit my uncle, who, uh, who lived in the States, and I'll get to this in a second. Um, and uh, we went on a road trip, and we went to the Kennedy Space Center. And this is actually Atlantis Space Shuttle. Uh, it sat in the launch pad. Every day I would wake up and I would get all excited to see the weather didn't quite work out and ended up uh, launching uh, maybe a, a day or two after we ended up leaving. But I remember going uh, to the center and looking at everything and thinking, space exploration is really cool. I really think I need to become an astronaut. Like this is the, the, this is the thing. So this is actually important in terms of some of the choices I made in life in, in terms of my trajectory. And you'll see a little bit that I think uh, having, a, having a focus at every time was I think the one critical step at, 
uh, 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 moving through my journey. So my journey. I mentioned that I didn't grow up in the States, so I actually grew up in a very small place in Greece uh, called the Malaga. Uh, and uh, by the time I was 17, I moved to this country uh, in order to go to college. And just for a second, do people know where Greece is? Yeah? So it's in Europe, uh, and it's this tiny little place that you can see. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, can I point? Maybe not. So, but you'll see it's this very small country, and for a reference, the population is about 11 million people. That is almost half the size of Los Angeles. So it's, it's a very small place. Um, and I moved, I came to the States uh, to go to college, thinking now I have it all figured out because I like math, I like chemistry, I need to be a chemical engineer, and I have family in Illinois, so University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign it is. I went through my, my, uh, uh, my checklist and uh, that was the place. One of the things that I got to appreciate while I was studying chemical engineering is how related the different fields are and tried to learn and learn about different segments of chemistry and biology and life sciences. Uh, and that was extremely exciting to me. So during this time, I, did a, I spent a lot of time actually working on different research projects. And that's a great way to actually get introduced to different things, learn from people, uh, and understand what you're good at, uh, learn, again, like, you know, build your, your toolkit of, uh, of things. So one of the projects that stuck with me, and part of it is uh, that uh, it was a NASA-sponsored project, and I am thinking, wow, this is really all coming together. I'm really meant to become an astronaut, so this is a project I have to work on. It was to worry about crystal growth as a solid-liquid interfaces during variable gravity. And you might say, what is that? And why is that even important? So at the time, it was a really big movement in saying, as we're doing space exploration, one of the key uh, questions is, can we actually construct materials in space rather than, than on Earth? And there are processes that we develop and tools sim to simulate processes that help us understand when we're building something to predict, is it going to be the way we want it or not? So there is a lot of work that has to go into that. Now, specifically for creating materials, one one of the elements that is, that, that is used uh, regularly is you have a mixture, for example, of metals that you're melting and you're pouring it to give it the shape that you want in order to build something with it. And one of the problems is that all the simulations rely on the fact that we have gravity on Earth. And the question was, can we actually, can our tools work in the absence of gravity? So I worked on this for a couple of years, and actually I, I, I studied it a lot, and one of the fun things that I got to do was actually I got to fly uh, my experiment on the KC-135, which is really just a big plane that flies in a parabola, and for about 30 seconds you ha you're, you're free falling, so you have zero gravity, you're weightless. Um, so again, now I'm fully convinced that everything is aligning in my in the universe for me to become an astronaut. So I'm looking up the criteria of what it takes to become an astronaut, and I'm thinking, I need to be a mission specialist. Now I need to go get my PhD in, in, in the same field, and I'm enjoying my field. This is perfect. Uh, so I, I, I went uh, uh, for, for my PhD at uh, UC Berkeley, uh, where one of the things that I ended up choosing to study was magnetic resonance imaging. And the reason that I wanted to do this was because I could continue my undergraduate research, and I was super excited about that. And I'm not thinking necessarily broadly other than to say, this is a tool, you can study solid-liquid interfaces, you can do a lot of different things with it. It's, it's, a, it's such a cool tool, so I, I, I get to learn more about it. So uh, while I was uh, starting my PhD, uh, there were, um, the funding uh, didn't come through. It, uh, it only lasted for a year. So I had to figure out something else to do. But meanwhile, I was getting to learn a lot about this, this tool, magnetic resonance. Uh, and there were some really cool features about it. So this is, uh, NMR is a, a magnetic resonance, is a spectroscopy tool. Like most spectroscopy tools, usually you have some kind of energy uh, you, you send into a material of interest and you're looking either at the way the energy is absorbed by your material or maybe the energy that is emitted back from your material. So there is a series of, of, of different techniques and modalities. Uh, 
And, and uh, NMR is used almost to give a, a fingerprint, so you can actually take a substance and get its signature, and you know it's that unique material that you have in front of you. You can also look at things like proteins in your body and how they're folded, and there's a lot of great work that happens, but there are some issues. And you see the issue there in, uh, in the top photograph. This is, a, will say, not necessarily the baseline typical system, but it is one of the advanced systems used for some, some, some of the studies. Uh, they're expensive. There's a huge magnet inside that. Uh, and what's critical is that the field in the center of the magnet is perfect. It's super, super homogeneous. Like the field is identical at every location over your sample. So it means you can study very small samples. You have a really expensive piece of equipment, so it means you can't study too many things. And there are definitely problems that can't be solved with it. So what I, uh, I, uh, I worked on was what we called, we called it the ex situ NMR which was can we take the system, figure out what, why it doesn't work in different settings, and then try to overcome the challenges. Uh, and that way it would enable uh, bringing it to the field to study different applications, including you know, emergency settings, medical diagnostics, and, and chemical analysis. So I spent I spend a few years uh, working on actually improving this tool. Uh, and, and building iterations of devices and, and coming up with systems that can actually bring you what we had in that really massive system uh, to something very small and inexpensive. Now, meanwhile, while I'm, I'm doing all this work and I'm, getting, I'm feeling very passionate about building tools and, 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 and seeing the outcome of that, uh, I realized that I really wished that the tools that I was building would be applied to improve everyday life. I really wanted to see the impact, and I wanted to see it then. And, and an opportunity came uh, where what was the chance that there was this mo small startup uh, coming up in Boston that really needed my unique expertise of building small portable uh, systems for magnetic resonance, uh, and they were proposing to use the system for diagnostics. So I, I, I joined. And, uh, and, and we ended up building the platform, and the platform was using the same technology that I was developing, uh, but also now working with nanoparticles. Now, nanoparticle, it is, I, I'm showing there as a sphere, it could have different shapes, but the important part is that it's a tiny material uh, in the order of 10 to 100 nanometers. Do you know what a nanometer is? Do, guess how big it is. Perfect. And just to give people a little bit of a comparison point, uh, hair is about 100 microns. Like a piece of paper is about 100 microns. So that is 1,000 times to 10,000 times smaller than a piece of, like, right, like the thickness of the uh, sheet of paper. So these are very, very small. And the important part about nanoparticles and nanomaterials is that they're, they're uh, at a size that is small enough to interface with things you might want to measure, for example, in a diagnostic device. But you can give them engineering properties. You can actually give them unique properties you can detect. And in this particular case, they had properties that we could detect with a magnetic resonance system. So we could actually say how many of these nanoparticles we had. And we can tell whether the nanoparticles were just free, say, if we were mixing them with a sample from a patient, versus whether this, they were actually coming together because they found a target of interest, so say something particular we were trying uh, to, to, to measure. So we developed this technology. And then I started thinking, it is great. So we actually ended up uh, releasing a product uh, that got approvals, meaning that it was uh, people decided, and there's there's a um, a group that decides what is safe to use, the FDA, and said this is safe, and we can actually put it in hospitals, and it can help people because now much quicker we can actually use it to detect whether someone has a particular type of infection, rather than doing what was done in the past, which is you bl you draw a, a blood sample for. Uh, patients, you might think that they have this particular type of infection, either a bacteria in them or, or a fungus, uh, and you wait for a few days for, 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 for the bugs to grow in the lab, and then you measure it. So, and, and in some cases, for really sick patients, that was really bad. So now I can start seeing the impact, and I'm feeling good about myself. 
And then I get contacted by Google. And of course I'm thinking, but it's Google, I have to consider it. But I'm not a computer scientist. What can I do at Google? And, and the, this was uh, interesting. And at the time, uh, the life sciences was not there. And I remember asking the only question I said I care about is anything would make me sign up for Google, but please tell me it's in the, it's, it's in the healthcare uh, space. I really don't want to change. So, so I came, and now maybe I can get back to my story about Verily Life Sciences, uh, which is, uh, again, and what, what is our mission? So I spoke a little bit about we want to build better diagnostics so we can earlier tell if someone is sick, uh, and then also we can come up with better interventions if we understand the disease. So how do we propose we do this? We need to understand human biology better, right? And the idea is now how can we take advantage of technology to do that? Okay, so we think we need to zoom in on, on health and disease. That's what we think we need to do. And here, this is the example of, of how we built uh, the, the map tools. Uh, and to say now, you can actually, I don't think anyone will find it surprising if I say, you can take a virtual tour of anywhere in the world, and you can be walking down streets and climbing mountains and being at the beach anywhere. You can actually go in and find my hometown in Greece and, and see where I grew up. That's pretty cool. So the idea of zooming in, so we can go from the map of the world, you can pick a city, you can see the streets, you can see the traffic, right? You can find buildings and floor plans. So that's exactly, uh, in, in order to do this, th there were a lot of series of technologies of things that needed to be developed. Sensors, right? Like, you know, obviously, you're, you're learning how, how to write basic code. All of that is critical. So now, as I said, we have tools, we have satellites that actually make this possible. So we need to build the right tools to do the same thing for human biology. And for human biology, we have, we're looking at populations, we're looking at the person at the individual level, we're looking at the organs, right, different organs to function, tissue, and then down to the cells, right? We're all made up of cells and even to molecules inside the cells. So then, of course, what we do, as I said, is really put our efforts in building the different tools. And we have clinical studies, and those are studies that actually study at the population level, and you can probe questions about, for example, behavior, right? That's, that's a, a big thing. I didn't necessarily touch upon it, but mental health is, is, a, is a big issue uh, and something we study. Uh, you also can check at things like, for example, uh, can I tell, can I use with software and try to change the behavior of people? Can I remind them to take their medications? These are, these are things we're working on. Uh, we build sensors. Uh, the watch that I'm wearing, right, it actually measures my pulse. So we are developing sensors to actually probe at the, at the system level, right? Like, you know, the physiometric monitoring, your heart rate, uh, when you're exercising, right, how much you're exercising. It can measure your, your breathing patterns. Uh, and so forth, so uh, down to very small sensors, we have the contact lens that can actually measure the level of glucose in the tear film. So this is a, a series of things that we're building. Um, then I spoke a little bit about the software, and the software is not only critical for things that I mentioned, things like apps, right, that you can build for, to remind people, but it's to analyze all the data, to drive all, everything that is happening here. And then in the center, I broadly call science, and it's specifically at Verily, where it's practically building the tools that we need to build in order to probe at the, at the higher level of, of focus, right? Like at more at that tissue level and smaller. Okay, so I, pr I will primarily speak a little bit about our baseline study just to give a, into context some of the, again, the, what is it that we're trying to do? So we call this, it's, a, it's one of our systems biology platforms. Uh, so what is the study? Um, so we've proposed, we said we need to understand health and disease, uh, and you might have heard, I don't know, in the news, like it was, uh, it, it, you know, uh, recently, um, about uh, precision medicine. Does that mean, uh, what does that mean is that really we want to treat people for them being individuals, right? Like we are all made up slightly differently, and sometimes what makes someone that is sick better uh, is, is different than, than another person. And it's the whole concept of trying to understand what is healthy, what is healthy variation, and then what are some early indications of disease. And in order to do this, we're looking at a, a, a population 
uh, and, and, and the population is, uh, has different groups. So we have people that are healthy and they have high likelihood, and I say high likelihood of remaining healthy based on their family history, for example, based on their records, based on who they are at the, at the, at the starting of the study. Um, versus people that are healthy and they have high likelihood of, of having one of the diseases that I mentioned, specifically heart disease and cancer, again, based on history. And in some cases, there are, there are groups that we have specifically to probe this where we know the likelihood is very high because, for example, maybe they already had cancer and there's high likelihood of them developing metastatic disease. And what we're doing is we're monitoring these patients over the, the course of five years. And of course, it will continue, but this is when we think we can start monitoring trends. Um, and that is important because, again, as we're trying, we're trying to, to measure a change. We're trying to understand variation, but then also we're trying to see a change in the individual level. And here, I'm showing a little bit the types of things we're probing, the types of questions. So there are the standard lab tests. This is usually what happens when a person goes to see their doctor. If, if, if they're good and they go once a year, as they should, um, uh, they will be wearing devices that can monitor, uh, as I said, different physiometric parameters. Uh, and then we are developing an array of tests. We're developing uh, an array of lab tests to actually monitor things like their genome, right? Like their full uh, makeup. Uh, so, uh, and, and try to understand their immune system, right? Your immune system is what fights, fights disease. Uh, see, for example, what antibodies you have in your, in your, in your body. How, is, uh, how immune cells look? Like, is, it, is, is everything looking the, the way that it should? Uh, and then, of course, you know, actually, we're, we're, we're doing full uh, whole body MRI scans and CAT scans. Um, so in order to do this, uh, we, have, we have a pretty uh, multidisciplinary team. Uh, and uh, for example, I spoke of software engineering, and this is uh, the typical workspace of our software engineers, uh, happily programming in their computers. Uh, and then we have our life sciences labs. Uh, and people here are working in a variety of assays, uh, developing nanoparticles, developing all kinds of different, uh, you know, uh, antibodies that uh, can actually uh, detect a particular antigen, right? It's almost like a lock and a key. Uh, so you can really detect something you're interested in. Uh, then we have a lot of scale up. A lot of the work is again, like, you know, working on the bench and then translating. Uh, so we do a lot of automation and scale up. We also have these machines are called sequencers. So this can actually go and read in order all the letters in your DNA code, right? So with one sample, it's pretty amazing. So, and these are the types of things that again, 10, 15 years ago would have seemed impossible to say we're gonna do this at a population scale, but technology advances brought this type of equipment in our labs, and now this is just a basic lab that we have and we can actually run the samples. Uh, then we actually also have, and this is actually uh, uh, the type of stuff that happens in my team as well. So we have a series of physicists and engineers building new tools because both, in, 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 you know, as I said, in a lot of cases, the kind of questions we can answer depend on the kinds of tools we have. So we develop tools to make sure that we can answer really difficult questions. Uh, and here, for example, right, like, you know, these are different methods to say, can I build better microscopy tools so that then the biologist can see things better? Uh, can I build better tools where here we're actually shortening cells so we can separate them and say, you know, from, from a sample with a mixture of cells, for example, even from, from, from your blood, you can actually separate individual cells and study them so you can ask more detailed questions about your makeup. Uh, and I think one of the most exciting parts and something that I feel uh, is, is actually coming together, not only at Google, but in general, people are understanding how important it is to actually have a variety of disciplines, uh, engineering and science, uh, together to actually uh, answer some of these questions. So in our team, we have doctors, we have biologists, immunologists, physicists, engineers, uh, and, and just working together, uh, we think we can make a difference. Um, and I hope, I'm getting back to, uh, to my um, science fiction uh, and uh, example, and say I really hope uh, that this is another science fiction problem that we can actually address by the right group of people with the right motivation. Uh, so I really think that we can build the medical tricorder, and Dr. McCoy, uh, this is a doctor at, at the fictitious show, uh, can actually deliver the right shot 
to cure the people that, uh, that are suffering from that particular disease. Uh, so hopefully I've convinced you that we can, we, we can give that a shot. So uh, thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you so much. I'm sure some of our amazing students here today would like to ask you a question or two. So at this point, if you have a question, please put your hand up. And myself and Marshall Lerner will come around with the microphone so you can ask Vicky some questions about anything at all, about her career path, about the projects she works on, about being an astronaut or not being an astronaut. <laughs> all right. Anybody back here have a question? Yeah? Oh, sorry. How did you feel when there was no gravity? It was really cool. It felt like swimming, but with no friction even, no resistance from the water. Uh, what was really interesting was that, uh, as I said, you were flying in a parabola in order to be free falling and not have gravity, and then you were pulling out of that, so you felt twice the force from gravity as you were pulling out, so that felt really bad. <laughs> but the weightlessness was really, really cool. Any questions on the other side of the room there? Now we have another one here. Um, what do you like best about being an environmental engineer? I am a chemical engineer. Yeah, and, and what I really like is I think a, I, it's, a, it's a very broad field. So you get to do a lot of different things. So you get to build things, you get to study things. So you have to know a little bit about biology, a little bit about chemistry, a little bit about engineering. Uh, and, and I think what I really like a lot is the fact that you actually, like again, as I said, specifically being a chemical engineer working in life sciences and life sciences tools, I feel really good about building tools for doctors that can actually really help the patients. Uh, and, and I'm hoping that you know the, the better tools the doctors have, the, the more they can do for people. Uh, so what would you have to study in order to um, be a chemical engineer? What do you have to study? So you have to study chemistry, math, physics. Uh, those are some of the, the main things. But of course, you also have to take classes like uh, arts and sciences and history and philosophy. And the more you study and the broader you are, the, the better you'll be. All right, we've got another question up here. How long did it take you to realize that you wanted to be a chemical engineer? So this is the part where I thought that I wanted to be a chemical engineer relatively quickly, but I didn't know necessarily what that was. And chemical engineering was very broad, right? So I knew I liked math and chemistry, and I was like, I totally am going to do that. Uh, but I think what I, you know, and again, as I said, I wouldn't have gone for my PhD if it wasn't for the fact that I wanted to be an astronaut and apply to the astronaut program. Uh, so a lot of it was, I always was passionate about building things and, and, and learning things. And I think that was kind of like, I also wanted to make sure that, that people understand the importance of following your dream, like actually finding something you really care about and pursuing it. And things always change a little bit and you learn more and the more you learn, the more you understand whether you need to change a little bit your direction. Yeah? Um, so currently the project is uh, being done. When is it estimated to uh, be completed? To be completed, ah, that's a very good question. Uh, so one thing about life sciences projects is that they're a little bit unpredictable. So there are elements of it. So when I speak of building a platform or being, building some of the tools, we're building tools as we speak and we're developing them and they're fully validating them. Then there co comes the question of saying, now we're studying some very hard biological problems. Biology is a little bit unpredictable, right? Like you may think you have the perfect hypothesis, right? We make a hypothesis and we, uh, we set out to actually interrogate our hypothesis. And then you figure out that uh, you, you learn something that you were not expecting. Even though I spoke of that study being a five-year study, 
I, that is not going to be the end. This is just the beginning. And something that I didn't fully highlight, when I showed some of the technologies that Google had to develop or even like partner up or acquire other companies that were developing technologies to get the maps to be where they are today, there were critical elements about sharing the data and getting users to come in and, for example, say, oops, in my neighborhood, the map is not correct. Fix it. And, and actually kind of leveraging the environment. And a lot of this work will rely on actually people coming in and kind of believing in this you know, you know that there's a very small percentage of people in clinical trials. This is something that has to change because we don't gather enough information. So I think it's, it's a very long-term project to actually say we need to change the way things are done and we need to actually make sure uh, we, we treat for outcomes, right? Like we make sure that we keep people healthy and that is how the whole system works. Okay, thank you. Oh, hi, yes. Um, hi. I have a daughter who works in public health. Uh, yes. do, you, do you work with public health people uh, yes. as part of your projects? And so they, they bring you more like statistical information? If or, I can give more statistical information? Yeah, do, is that what they contribute? You know, more the trends, statistics of disease? So. Uh, there are a lot of elements, right? Like, so when I spoke about, you know, we have the Diabetes Management Initiative, uh, there, there are things, for example, as I said, that it, it is all about, and maybe even beyond diabetes management, where there's a lot of work that, that uh, is being suggested for Google, right, like, you know, wants to, to help with things like even electronic health records and integration. And, and, and these are, again, like very big problems because there is the state of the art and epic and so forth uh, that it will take a while to figure out the best way to actually do this. Uh, and we have examples, for example, where entering the surgical robotic space and there because we're actually working, um, uh, we have a company uh, joint venture with J&J with &J to build a more smart robots and similar to how we're working with the car where you have uh, the, the, the one car learning from the learnings of the other the surgical robots will be teaching each other, right? Like, so from every procedure, this is what makes a great surgeon, right? It is uh, the experience and the knowledge from different cases. So all of that will be integrated. So all of the, all, all of the different sur surgical robots will be learning from that. Um, but there's, a, again, maybe, I, I don't know if I'm uh, necessarily answering your question, but the work that we do spans everything from what you would imagine, like for example, a computational analyst to do to pretty much everything else, because all of this information that I was describing, it would be useless if it's not connected, right? You need to keep track of all the tests, of all the people over the time, and try to figure out similarities and whatnot. So uh, the, the analytical component is super critical, and it is really the glue that is keeping everything together. All right, we've got another question on this side. Uh, so what's the most difficult part about being a chemical engineer? Difficult, huh? Um, I don't know if I'd say difficult. It takes discipline, right? I think, but it takes discipline to do anything in life and be good at it. So I'll say, I think it's a, a general comment that I'll say in order to be good, and you want to be good because otherwise, like, right, like, you're not taking advantage of all the impact you can make, right? You can make a bigger impact. Uh, so I think it's, that's the general comment. Yeah. Great. Any other questions from anyone in the audience here? Any of our instructors and volunteers want to ask anything? No? Oh, there's, there's someone at the back. Marcia Lorena, can you? Yeah. <laughs> so I was, I, ma I minored in chemistry, so I was actually really interested when you brought up the NMR. Okay. Um, you said that you were able to get a magnet or the NMR machine way smaller. Mm -hmm. Have an XC2 NMR. How strong is that magnet compared to like the regular one? So one Tesla was the biggest one. And again, so it depends a lot on the applications you care about. So the diagnostic application that we ended up, it's more kind of like an end product that utilizes the NMR system. 
uh, we were probing parameters that were much simpler than solving chemical structures. But as you know, you probably relate to the fact you can resolve things based on not only how strong your field is, but also how homogeneous it is. And a lot of the work that I was doing was primarily looking at how to fix the fact that now when you are in a small magnet, uh, you actually don't have a perfect feel. So it was actually working on what is called shimming, so you're familiar with shimming, uh, but doing active shimming. So you have, in addition to having the permanent magnetic field, like that big, big, right, like uh, uh, hyperconducting magnet, or in my case, a permanent magnet, you actually have small shims, and you program them so you can measure the field and the field in homogeneity locally, and you can counter it. You can actually send a small magnetic field and, and counter the, uh, at the local environment during the time that you need to acquire your signal. So we ended up, again, and a lot of the work was obviously, with the exception of the work once I moved to the startup, it was proof of concept. We built a lot of systems, uh, potential homeland security applications and whatnot, but they haven't become end products. Uh, so a lot of the, again, the capability was demonstrated and then uh, in, in my application, at least the field strength was not necessarily as important. Thank you. Sure. Great, we've got another question on this side over here, sorry. Uh, what's the most fun part about being um, a chemical engineer? The most fun part, I think is just that, yeah, as I said, just being able to work with a lot of different people that are very passionate about what they do and working on big problems that I feel can really make a difference. Um, so yeah, and of course, even like the day-to-day, -day, it's always, you're constantly learning, and for me, that's super exciting. Great, any last questions? Any final questions? Well, I have a question for you. So. Um, You've talked a lot about your own journey and the great and exciting work you're doing. And with this room full of middle school students who are just getting started on these pathways to all the different things that they're gonna take on in their lives, what advice would you give them? If you could give them some advice as they're heading off into the rest of middle school, high school, hopefully maybe college and beyond, what advice would you give them as they're moving on in their lives? I'll say there, there are a couple of things. The one thing, and it's, it's, it's a little bit of my, uh, my quote and a stolen quote that is I usually never quite say it right because English is my second language and I use that excuse all the time, um, is that we, just do what you really love and, and things will, have, will, will come along, right? Like actually, I feel like it says, it, it's a quote from my favorite, one of my favorite books is that the universe almost conspires to make it happen. Uh, and I think the, the most important thing is Pick something that you're really passionate about and, and put all your energy into it because that's the best way that you can actually make, make the biggest impact. And also, don't worry about the fact that you might not necessarily know where you want to be in 20 years, or right? Just think at the moment, what are you passionate about? Be really good at it. And things will actually, the more you learn, the better you understand what you should be doing. So uh, everything uh, works out at the end.